Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I am Preston Jones, and I'm honored, honored to welcome you to what is going to be an outstanding, outstanding morning. You're in for a treat. And uh, this is a beautiful morning in Florida, isn't it? Yes. You're waking up to, uh, my son lives in Arizona, he's waking up to snow. <laughs> <laughs> so this is really, really special. And also, this is the continuation of our celebration for Black History Month. And the speaker that you will hear today, Lillian Lincoln Lambert, uh, has a special message to us uh, that is fitting for the occasion. I'd like to uh, open my introduction by reading a, a quote from B.B. King. And B.B. King says, I only went through 10th grade, but you'll see all kinds of textbooks around me. The more popular I become, the more I miss education. Whether you play the blues or whatever, don't let people keep you like you were. <laughs> Lillian Lincoln Lambert is the first African American woman to receive a Harvard Business School MBA during the tumultuous 1960s and then became a barrier-breaking entrepreneur in the mid-1970s. Born on a farm in the segregated South at age 18, she journeyed to New York City and Washington, D.C. to hold menial jobs as a maid and typist. Realizing that education was key, she obtained a bachelor's degree from Howard University, Washington, D.C., Bison, and took the advice of a professor and applied to Harvard. Lambert was one of six black students and one of 18 females in the class of 800 students, 800 students at Harvard Business School. And in 1969, in the midst of civil and, and women's rights movements, Lambert earned her MBA and achieved the historical milestone as the first African-American woman to receive a Harvard MBA. That's just a part of the story. I'm sure you're anxious to hear the rest. Professor Lambert. Good morning. Good morning. And thank you for having me. I am honored to be here. And I'm, I'm really happy to be in Florida. Last week I was in Richmond, Virginia. It was cold. It was nice on Friday, 62 degrees, snowing on Saturday, and cold and windy on Sunday. I left there and went to New Jersey where it was raining and snowing. Flew into Fort Lauderdale yesterday, and I was so glad to see the sunshine. <laughs> thank you for having me. So I, I love being in Florida, and I'm really honored to be here. And thanks to um, a few people for Kareem is responsible for getting me here. He kept talking about it, so I said, okay, finally got to go. And I want to talk to you. I will share some of my story. And what I'm going to uh, do is uh, talk for a little bit about uh, my background, and then I'm going to answer some questions that have been designed by uh, uh, Jade and her team mm -hmm. and have it open to the audience for questions. So feel free to ask questions. I will answer them as honestly as I can. If I don't know the answer, I will try to find out. And if it's a question I don't want to answer, I'll plead the fifth. So <laughs> we'll go from there. OK, OK. Now, as a child, I remember being told early that um, learn all you can, because once you get it in your head, no one can take it from you. And that is so true. But even after give, being given that kind of advice, I still had to get an education from the School of Hard Knocks first. Um, and as I talk to people, they think that my life was very well planned. I had to do everything all laid out. Uh, that's not the case at all. I grew up on this little farm that uh, the dean mentioned in Ballsville, Virginia, a very small farm. But the little town was really small, maybe 250 people. We knew everybody who lived there. So I, that was my world. I didn't know anything beyond that until I, was, until I left home at, at the age of 18. Matter of fact, the, the, uh, the closest city was Richmond, Virginia. That was 50 miles away. So that was a big treat to just go to Richmond, Virginia. So after, uh, after high school, uh, you would think I would be headed for college. Well, my mother was a, a college-educated woman. She got her college education and degree in 1922, which was <laughs> very unusual for even women to be going to college then, in particular for a black woman to get her education. And the one thing I regret is not talking to her more about how that happened. She was one of 10 children, the only one who went to college. 
And she desperately wanted me to go to college. My father, on the other hand, was a, uh, he did not, was not an educated man. He had a third grade education. He thought hard work was the uh, way to success. And mom thought education was this. So she talked to me about education and encouraged me to read and read. But at that time, as a, you know, I was a know-it-all 18-year-old. Anybody know people like that? <laughs> You know, I know what's best for me. I'm not going to college. There's no money. I'm going to go to the big city. And I went to New York City. I just wanted to leave the farm, go to the big city, get me a good job, meet Prince Charming, and live happily ever after. <laughs> that was my dream from small town. Well, little did I know, here I am going to New York City from a little town of 200 people, and you find 200 people in one building in New York City. So, but little did I re realize that this big city wasn't waiting for my arrival, this little girl from the farm with a high school education and some big dreams. I wanted to work in an office. That was my goal at that time as an 18 year old. I just wanted a nice office job. But I couldn't find one. They wouldn't hire me. I, the best I could do was working as a maid for a family on Fifth Avenue. Hated the job. But whenever I'm in a situation, I try to learn something from every situation. And I say, I'm going to learn something from this job. Well, this job exposed me to the way people lived who had money. And I loved what I saw. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, nice big apartment, all the clothes you want. And, and I said, now, I want to live like that one day. But how am I going to do that? I knew I couldn't do it working as a maid. So I said, OK, got to think of something else. Finally did get that good job in the office working at Macy's department store. Did that for two years. But Thought the pay was great, $45 a week. <laughs> you only get more than that for an hour now in some job. And I just thought I'd be able to make it where I wanted to go, but I couldn't live on $45 a week in New York City, even in the 1960s. It was like 1960 then. By the time I paid my rent and paid my car fare and bought my lunch, I had no money left. My goal then was to buy a second pair of shoes. I could never get enough money to buy a second pair of shoes. By the time I got enough money, I'd want that pair I had. I vowed that if I ever got enough money, I'd buy all the shoes I wanted, and I have honored that. <laughs> I love shoes. <laughs> My husband can vouch for that. It doesn't matter. It's a good deal. I'll wear them sometime. <laughs> but I, I finally, after about Two years in New York City, I realized that I just couldn't make it in New York City. I had to do something different. I moved to Washington, D.C., and I floundered for another couple of years with my good government job, working in a typing pool, typing reports for uh, uh, doctors from doing their veterans' appeals. And I was the youngest person there. I think I was 20 years old then. It was a big pool of uh, about four, 30 or 40 people sitting around typing all day long. I think it were two guys and rest were women. And I walked in one day and I said, I can't do this the rest of my life. I got to do something different. Finally, I swallowed my pride and asked one of my cousins to help me find a way to get to college. He wanted to help me earlier. My mom, he, as I found out later, my mom kept talking to him. Mother's ne Mama never gave up on me, and mothers don't give up on you. She kept talking to him about getting me into school, and he kept prodding me about it. I used to hate to see him coming. Oh, here comes Rudolph again. I'm going to get out of his way. I know what he's going to say. Well, finally, I went to him. You know, sometimes you just have to realize that you, you made a mistake. Swallow your pride and do what you need to do. I asked him to help me find a way to go to college, and he did. He helped me. At first, I was working full time, and I went to uh, college at night uh, to what was then DC Teachers College, now the University of District of Columbia. And I took uh, 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 three hours, six hours one semester, nine hours the other semester. But then I realized I'd be really old by the time I finished. <laughs> so I said, no, I can't do that long. So at 22 years old, I entered Howard University uh, using scholarships, loans, and part-time work. Um, got on campus, still had no idea what I was going to do was a lost soul. You know, when you're, in, when you're in college at 22 as a freshman, everybody else 18, it's a big gap in that, that four years is a lot of difference at that age. You know, when you get older, four years is not much. But at that age, I was there f because I knew I had to work hard and get my work done. Uh, so I, I didn't enjoy, I didn't have a lot of social life, didn't do a lot of partying. And I, I met Professor H. Naylor Fitzhugh as a freshman. He uh, 
really, really helped turn my life around. Uh, he probably saw me as a lost soul wandering around on that campus, not knowing what to do and where to go and what to major in. So he talked to me about majoring in business. He was a professor of marketing and literally took me under his wing and guided me through that process at Howard. He also saw that I was a struggling student financially and he hired me as a student assistant, uh, hired me, gave me additional work, helped typing his dissertation, and I was working on a part-time job 20 hours a week. So he helped me a lot in getting through, through school. But then he began to talk to me during my junior year about going to graduate school. Well, I'm 26 when I graduate. I don't want to go to graduate school. I want to go get me a job, make some money. I still, you know, I've, all these years I still haven't made any money. <laughs> so I had no intent to go to graduate school. But he'd keep talking about it. He was the kind of person that could talk to you in a way and plant a seed and then it, it, sort of make, like, make, it, make you feel like you came up with the idea yourself. <laughs> you know people like that? He would never nag you. He'd just plant that seed. And I'd, I'd see him at work and he'd ask me something about graduate school and I'd still, well, yeah, I'm going, but I haven't thought, I, haven't, I don't know where yet. Finally, I said, well, I better start thinking about this. I better at least look at some graduate school. So one day he asked me again about graduate school. I said, oh, yeah, I'm going. He said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to apply to Stanford, University of Chicago, and maybe University of Michigan. I picked out three schools. I didn't know anything about them, but they sounded good to me. And he said, why not Harvard? And I just looked at him. I said to myself, this man's got to be crazy. <laughs> me at Harvard. I knew nothing about Harvard. All I knew was this place somewhere out there, this prestigious school that rich and super intelligent people went to. And I just looked at him and I said, Harvard? I don't know what I'd respond and I just went back and I said to myself, I'm not going to apply to Harvard. I may apply to some of the other schools. But he kept talking to me and finally and finally, then there was another guy there who was head of the Small Business Development Center. He started talking to me about going to Harvard. And I said, okay, now I'm going to apply so these guys can just leave me alone. <laughs> so I did. I applied and lo and behold, he kept telling me I'm Harvard material. And lo and behold, I didn't do anything to prepare myself. I took the GMAT and applied. They rejected me. Then I said to myself, the nerve of them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to Harvard. You know, the guy told me. At first, he told me I was Harvard material. I just took admission for granted. You know, he said I could go, so obviously I can go. <laughs> well, you got to prepare yourself for whatever you're going into. I decided, instead of seeing this as a defeat, I said, okay, I am going to Harvard. I went back, started studying for the GMAT of the old freshen up, took the course, improved my scores, applied, and I got in. So that's how I ended up at Harvard. Well, now what he didn't tell me, well, he had graduated from Harvard in 1931, one of the first African-American women to go there. He went to how a Harvard undergraduate and then went to the business school. It was really rough for him. But he didn't tell me that no black women had ever gone. I didn't know that until I'd been there. And in hindsight, I said, well, maybe it's good he didn't tell me because I'm not sure I would have gone. I'm not sure I wanted to deal with that situation because I, I, I didn't go there before I went there to start classes, didn't go to research or anything, visit the school because I'm just going. I probably would not have done it. The other interesting thing about being there is that women didn't go into the business, get accepted into the business school until 1963. I went there in 67. So the business school was not yet ready for us. We could not live on the business school campus in the dorm where the men li lived because the dorms were not designed for women. They were designed strictly for men. They had not redesigned them. So we had to live in the Radcliffe graduate dorm, which was about a half a mile away from the uh, business school. And we had to walk to school every day. And we had to dress as professional business women, which meant heels and stockings and suits and dresses, no pants. And it was very cold up there. So I got real friendly with the one lady in the class who had a car. <laughs> <laughs> so I got to ride to school every day. <laughs> but sometimes I walk. But there were, there were some other disadvantages of uh, being there as far as study groups. With the, with the, they, they encourage you to be a part of study groups. But the study groups were on the business school campus at night. And usually we finish school at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. You go back to the dorm, you don't want to walk back to school at night and, and walk back to the dorm late at night. So most of the women did not participate in the study group. <coughs> and what I, what I found out after I um, wrote my book, doing the research, 
I talked to some of the women who had been there, and they were as intimidated as I was. I didn't realize it. But none of them, one or two of them did get in study group. One was uh, very, very smart, and she stayed on campus and went to study. The other one had some of the guys who came to the dorm. They volunteered to come over and study with her. But you know, the logical thing for us to have done was form our own study group. We never thought about that again. We were just scared. Everybody studying by themselves. You know, we were so intimidated by all these men who were very aggressive. I, I used to say, you get in class, it was a class of 100 students sitting in this uh, elevated classroom, and the, it was a strictly case study. I don't know whether they'll use cases or not, but that's all we used, no textbooks. And the teacher would call on you and start talking. You got these, and they made sure there were only more, more than two women in each section. So you were there with 98 men. And no, Af Af no two African Americans were in the same section. There were only six in my class, five guys and me. I used to say you, was, you were fighting for airtime. <laughs> because if you didn't raise your hand and start talking, at some point, the professor wouldn't know who you were, and your grades were 90% based on class participation. So it was a very intimidated setting. And <clears throat> but you had. To, Thanksgiving was critical dropout time. Folks went home for Thanksgiving, and a percentage of them didn't come back. <laughs> I was almost in that number, but I said, no, I can't. You know, the run, one, people say, why did you stay? One of the main reasons I stayed is because I couldn't give up on myself because I knew I could do it, and I thought of all the other people that I would disappoint. Now, can you imagine if I had quit what they would say when somebody else applied? We had one. Didn't make it. So I had an obligation and a responsibility to get through there, but it was not easy, both from an academic standpoint and a social standpoint. So those of you who have all these friends and things around you and support systems around you, but the one thing I'm very proud of having been there is uh, we established the African American Student Union while I was there to be a support system for others who came behind us and to make sure that they start bringing in more students, we decided to go talk to the dean one day about why there weren't more African-American students there. Primary university for training managers, why aren't we represented? We need to be trained too. We didn't know what the dean would say, whether he'd even agree to meet with us, whether he'd kick us out of school or what. Yeah, we are raising the run because, you know, this was doing the sit-ins and all those things. And business school was very conservative. The, the rest of the university was dealing with sit-ins and students and all those things. The business school was like, what's going on over there? <laughs> If it didn't deal with the bottom line, they didn't deal with it. So we didn't know what the dean would do, say. Dean George Baker, I will always remember, big guy. So we walked in and started talking to him about why there weren't more African-American students in the university. And his response was honest but surprising. He said, we don't know where to find them. And my thought was, a logical starting point is historical black colleges. But I don't know if they never thought of it or just didn't even consider that there was a, a, they, we weren't there. So we talked to him and we said, okay, we'll help you find them. And we worked at a, a deal with him and he was very receptive. He agreed to send all of us back to our alma maters and other colleges to recruit. And he, in turn, would go out to corporations to get scholarship money. And he did. And I. And I do think that was a turning point for the university. The next year, they brought in 27 African-American students. So that was a real change. And as the, the role we saw of the African-American Student Union was to be a support system for those students so that they wouldn't deal with some of the issues and things that we dealt with. But as we recruited them and as we had events for them during the year, we made sure that they clearly understood that they were there for a purpose. And that they, we want to make sure that they got in, but we also want to make sure they got out. So we want to make sure they understood that they could not goof off and play and say, well, I went to Harvard, and that's it. You've got to work hard. And we made sure they were aware of the, the difficulty of the curriculum and the fact that nobody, nobody was going to be holding their hands, but the, the African American Student Union would be there for them if they needed some guidance. And now they have a one day when the students come, they have a, a treat away from the university where they talk about all kinds of issues that the uh, uh, students would deal with. Not only, but simple things like, you know, where do you get your hair cut? Where does a beauty shop? You know, things that students, those are simple things. 
what church is you are in the area? Thank you, you may not think of as a part of being in a school, but the things that are very important to a person feeling comfortable in that environment. So that was my story about my Harvard experience. I'm sure you'll have other questions. Uh, we're going to take a few questions. But if you have, uh, I haven't talked about my going into business yet, but maybe we can get into that some during the question and answer. We have some questions uh, that uh, Tawana is going to be putting up on the board. I will respond to those. But feel free to interrupt me for expansion on any of the questions that I deal with or questions that you have that you'd like to be uh, answered. That's a question. Let's start right back here then first. Interestingly enough, the women, I mean, that's, that's great, <laughs> expanded, it's about 40% women now. Mm -hmm. They're celebrating in April the 50-year anniversary of when they first admitted women, April 4th and 5th, I think. So, but African American is now, it's only it's low, probably 5%, but mm -hmm. overall diversity is, mu is about 20% different. When I went there, we had, uh, as I mentioned, this uh, room we sat in with the name, we had to have our name tags on the, on, in front of us. Everybody's name, Brown, Smith, Jones, Johnson, etc. I went back a few years ago, I can't even pronounce half the name. They're from everywhere, all nationalities. Uh, it's, it's a much more diverse group. Now they have, in the first and second year class, they have about uh, 125, 150 African Americans. The numbers, uh, percentage-wise, not great, but the numbers are much higher than I was there. So it's still, it's still uh, acting. We've set up a, uh, we established a, a chair in the name of Best Venture at, at Harvard. The African American Student Union and other corporations and professors also raised five million dollars to establish a chair in his name. Uh, this was probably about ten years ago. Yes. Do you uh, face racism at Harvard? You know what? It's, it was there, I'm sure, but it was kind of undercurrent. And people said, what was it like being there? I said, it was, it was like I was invisible. People didn't acknowledge me literally being. Sometimes that's worse than folks dealing with you. Because sometimes you, you walk around, somebody say a kind word to you. You're there all, nobody that looked like you there, and just having people ignore it. There was some of uh, the students who were very friendly. And fortunate for me, I was assigned to Section D. Section D followed you all your life. Section you're assigned to, I still get mail from sec related to Section D. <laughs> and I was seated between two guys who were really very friendly. And that's good. But there were guys that who not only didn't think I should be there, they didn't think women should be there. They were taking up a seat that should belong to a man. Mm -hmm. So you would deal with all of that. Uh, the, the racism was undercurrent. Nobody had very openly or verbally said things, but sometimes you could sense it and tell. But, you know, I just don't let that kind of stuff bother me. If people ask me a question, I was at uh, Prudential New Jersey the other day, someone asked me about experience with racism. I said, I just act like it doesn't exist. <laughs> I can't let that be a yoke around my neck. It's there, I know it's there, so I just deal with it. And you know, I'm not sure which one is in play here, sexism or racism, so you know, I just you know, deal with both. Yes? Uh, as you look back on, on the path, what would you say is the greatest challenge that you faced ever? Ever. Ever. <laughs> <laughs> and then, what, what did you do with the challenge? Wow. The biggest challenge, I mean, I got a number of them. <laughs> I'm not sure which one the biggest one. Dealing with just getting through Harvard was a challenge. It really was. Uh, that, cause that's, and I guess that was probably the biggest one because it, it covered such a long period of time. You know, two years of literally isolation and feeling like you don't belong and questioning why you're there and mm -hmm. how am I going to get it. You know, all kinds of issues. That was one of them. But the, what, how I got to that was just the determination of I'm here and I have the responsibility and, uh, to myself and to all those people who supported me. And Profe I could, Professor Fitzhugh would probably, I'm not sure what he would have done to me if I didn't graduate. <laughs> <laughs> and then I have, you know, my mother was very proud. Even, you know, even my father, who I mentioned had a third grade education. He didn't even know anything about Harvard and didn't think much of education, but he was so proud of Lauren telling people that Lillian was going to the same school that President Kennedy went to. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I had to speak to all the stuff back I was going. I guess the other uh, big challenge I had was when I started my business. And um, so getting it started, the I, I went into a 
male dominated industry, the building maintenance industry, which is a basic cleaning service. Uh, what I found, I went to work for a company for three years doing that, running that company. That's when I learned about the industry. I knew nothing about that industry at the time. And I found how lucrative it was, but I also realized that most of the companies were owned by white men. Most of the employees were black women. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, you know, I ought to be in this mix somewhere. <laughs> I've done it for three years. I know how this business runs. I know the challenges it faced. So getting that started during a time when there were very few women-owned business, I didn't know any women business owners, and also in a male-dominated industry. And one of the big challenges I faced was I started I, as a, a 8 a contractor, which was a special program set aside by the federal government to help minority firms get a chance to bid on government contracts. So it was set aside for minority-owned firms. So obviously I qualified. I'm a black female. I'm a double dipper. <laughs> <laughs> I applied for the program and turned me down. <laughs> So I had to fight to get into the program, and they turned me down, they said, because they could not guarantee they could get me contracts. Well, the program wasn't set up for them to get me contracts. Mm -hmm. I was supposed to get my own contract, and then just funnel it through the program. So they finally said, okay, we will approve you if you can show us that you can get your own contracts. Mm -hmm. Well, luckily, I'd done my homework when I left my job. I stopped talking to government agencies about them allowing me to work with them. And I was able to send them a list of names, phone numbers, and agencies who were willing to do business with me. So I finally got approved, and then I identified a contract that an agency was willing to work with me on and send it to them, and they would give it to me. So I said, okay, I've done my work. Now it's your turn. If you don't, if you don't work with me and approve this, then I'm just going to my congressman and see what he can do about it. I got a contract. But I had to fight to get it set up in business just mm -hmm. to get started. So those are, I would say, I could probably take the rest of this hour telling me about challenges I face, but those are two, I think, major ones. Hi, building on that question. Um, I realize that you graduated with, in 1969, is that correct? Yes. All right. Now, I do believe that's when President Nixon was in power, is that true? Johnson. Johnson. All right. Well, um, during that period of time, I know that the economy suffered from stagflation, meaning, you know, prices were going up, inflation, even though from the capitalistic perspective, it looks like it was going right with the businesses. But you, having the background you had coming from a small town, knowing the suffering that the people, you know, how, how did you use that experience? How did you take that with you to Harvard to be able to implement that, incorporate that in your um, MBA process? And you mean the, the economy, but the yes. situation? I can rephrase if you would like. It, it <laughs> okay, rephrase it to a question. Yes, okay. Okay. <laughs> All right, so um, during this period of time, um, we had it's a decade, so I don't, I'm not going to give you exact numbers, but I know that the economy was, um, we had rising um, supply for goods, because at this part of time, the United States economy was importing, exporting trade, it looked like it was going well. But at the same time, we had the Vietnam War going on. So yeah, right. This was when Johnson was in power, he agreed not yes. to run the custody of Vietnam yes, Wall. Yes, yes. <coughs> now I, okay, so Nixon, you know, that whole Watergate issue, we'll put that aside. Because everybody has their own opinion. Okay, we'll yeah. get your question then. Yes, I will. <laughs> <laughs> it's just I need to clear everything up. From, from, I know you're one of those people that you wanted to learn because you, not only you weren't sheltered in the sense that you stayed in that mindset of your small time, you, I could tell you. How did I take that to heart? Yes, how did you take that? How did you, because I know, it's, I try, I've talked to people. How did you take that experience coming from a small town to deal with people? Well, I, the, I took advantage of what I learned, what I knew from coming there. I grew up in a small town. Uh, we didn't have a lot, I was poor. I don't, know, I, may have, I don't know what poverty was then, but maybe I wasn't poverty stricken, but I was poor. <laughs> and I used that information, so sometimes you, uh, when you're in a situation like that, you're able to use what you have much better than a person who hasn't been there. Mm -hmm. 
and don't know what it's like to have to cut back. You know, the, it, whatever I experienced, I had to be better than what I had, is what I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. So, and I also took advantage of learning as much as I could. For example, uh, I, when I went to Harvard, I didn't know much about things like the stock market, investment, and all those things. The, most of the people in my class, this is, that was conversation around the dinner table for them, yes. but not for me. So you listen to something, you learn, you, 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 you take some initiative to learn things on your own also. So if somebody said something in class, I don't know what it was, I'd go find out what it meant. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to, and people are willing to share with you and help you learn, to, but you gotta be careful who you ask that for. So I use whatever tools I had in place to help me along the way, and sometimes they're not all there, and you just have to be aggressive enough. And I, even then, I didn't know as much as I should have, or when I left, as much as I wanted to, but you, it's a learning process. Uh, I'm still learning things. Jenny never finished that, so it's an ongoing process. But I just took what I had. I didn't use that as the excuse not to get better. I didn't say, oh, I came to this whole farm and I'll never be like them. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily have to be like them. I'm going to be like I am right. and improve myself. And that may be different. You know, being, sometimes people are unique. Being different is not bad. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, we're all different. So use your uniqueness to make a difference someplace. Else. What kind of opportunities, if any, were there for you in corporate America? At that time, <laughs> 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 or was this your first, uh, you know, when you when you started your own business? Was no, that your goal? no, no, it was not a goal. I never thought I'd be an entrepreneur. And when I left Harvard, I had four jobs over a six-year period. Now, during that time, that was not traditional. I mean, at that time, you got went to school, you came out, you had a good job, you stayed there, you retired. Well, I didn't play in that mode. So I've always been a little unorthodox now. In certain ways, um, if it wasn't working for me, I mean, a couple of them, one, one closed the office. I started the first firm I went without a graduate school, a small consulting firm in Washington. And they closed the Washington office, so then I had to take other job. If it wasn't working for me, I made a change. I, I had that job, then I went to a, a, a work in a banking association. And uh, I think they, they, their funding got cut, so I left. I went to, um, became a stockbroker and didn't like that at all. Mm -hmm. And I went to teach at a university and did that. I like teaching, but I also, during the summer that I, before I signed my teaching contract, I got a chance to work for this company that I ended up working with as a consultant during the summer, and he wanted to hire me during the year. So I had to choose between staying in teaching and being an entrepreneur. But that year that I taught, I really enjoyed it, and I worked uh, for this company. So I basically had two full-time jobs. I mean, I was with, people talk about what we women can and cannot do. <laughs> Men do well, too, but. <laughs> <laughs> but. But that year, I was working, I was teaching, I uh, taught four courses, I left college, went downtown D.C. and worked, like one o'clock, and worked all day down there, took work, basically I was the executive vice president, worked there, and I was pregnant. So I had my baby doing semester break. <laughs> she came, she came, and she came a, a month early. I tell her now, that's the only time I like her life that she's been very cooperative. <laughs> <laughs> and then I went back to teaching. But then I had to choose between, I didn't want to do that all the time. I chose between teaching and being an entrepreneur. So no, I I I had not I'm not one of these people who always dreamed of being an entrepreneur. I went to work for this company, a young lady who worked with me in the first job I had at Harvard, in this consulting firm, called me one day and said her father had this uh, building maintenance company and he was having all kinds of problems. He needed somebody and she told him he should hire me to come in. So I went in strictly with the idea of being a consultant, but he offered me a full-time job and I learned a lot. I used to wonder, when am I going to use all the stuff I learned at Harvard? <laughs> well, I had to use that and more working for that company. They had every problem you could see of a bad uh, bank loan. They owed IRS like $130,000 with all the taxes. They owed uh, bad banking relations, bad customer relations. He was a great marketer, but that was the, the limit. He could sell anything, but once he got it in the house, it fell apart. <laughs> Nobody was managing. So I, I did that job, and it was a great job. But I decided I would uh, go out on my own. So that was, I was not always thinking I was going to be an entrepreneur. 
But you have no way to pass the picture. You have to Since I talked about you guys, this guy say something. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Donald Watson. I grew up with Kareem in Ohio, but oh, I grew up a lot faster than he did. <laughs> 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 I'm talking about you. I'll tell you what you said. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I know, like, Florida, for instance, now has the first African American president of the Florida Bar, and of course, we have the first African American president of the United States. Okay. One of the things that we study history about first is they're not the first qualified, although right. they're the first to have the opportunity. I'm going to ask you a question that a, a student asked me a couple weeks ago at a, at a presentation. What is your legacy? My legacy is that I use the opportunities and skills that I have to make sure that others have the same kind of opportunity. The way I do that now is have my business. I spend my time now talking to people, sharing my experience. I mentor a lot of mostly young women. Uh, and making sure that I can help them get to where I got or where they want to go without having to go through a lot of the steps that, that uh, we went through. Because there's still, there's still obstacles around. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They may not be the same, they may not be quite as obvious, but the opportunity, and the, the pie is getting smaller, I think, in some ways. So you've got to be a lot more um, prepared. Like I tell when I speak to groups a lot, the lady asked me what, another question, I'll tell them that I had a young lady ask me a question uh, a couple years ago. She was a student who graduated with honors from an Amherst in law school, getting ready to graduate from honors. She said, how does a young woman compete in this male-dominated environment? I said, well, male-dominated otherwise, the three things <coughs> that remember, it's important to be what I call well-grounded in the three C's, competence, confidence, and comfort. You first of all have to be confident in whatever you're going into, be well prepared, and be able to change with, with the change of the needs of the marketplace. You know, technology now, it changes so fast, you want to keep up with it. But then you have to be really confident in yourself. Because if you're not confident in yourself, people can see your lack of confidence. You show it in some way. And sometimes you have to fake it till you make it, I say. And then you have to be comfortable in the situation you're in. You may find yourself in a situation where you thought you wanted to be, but you're not comfortable there for whatever is going on. It may be the environment, it may be the way the company operates, or it's just not what you want to do. If you're not comfortable there, and you will know when it gets so uncomfortable you can't tolerate it, and it's time to leave. Yeah. So you'll know that. So my legacy is that I don't just keep what I've learned and experience I've had to myself that I share it. And build. I, I'd love to have a foundation doing all this stuff. Did anybody want to set up a family? <laughs> How did you feel to be the first African-American woman to go to Harvard? You know, I didn't see it as a big thing. I, I didn't even know until I, I, I either graduated or close to graduation. People started talking to me about this, and I'm thinking, what's the big deal? <laughs> I was doing what I had to do. I didn't see myself, oh, I'm the first I, I didn't go there to make history. I went there to make a better life for myself. And I didn't, don't, didn't, didn't say, oh, gee, this is what I'm doing. I'm sending this back. I didn't even know it until I had either graduated or close to graduated and somebody told me about it. But to me, it just doesn't seem like such a big deal. But then I, I, then I began to realize that people appreciated and respected that fact. So then I began to sort of enhance it and use it to, I don't go around the advertising. I feel, as a matter of fact, I, I, my husband's my great support. He tells me about it. <laughs> you talked about um, being in school and doing well as a kind of obligation because your mom was expecting so much of you and others. And, and then in your response to his question, you talked about uh, this each one teach one attitude you have. Do you think we still have that in our community? And if not, not to the extent that we should. Yeah. I mean, there are a lot more of us now, so there are a lot more people that should be doing more than they're doing. Sometimes we get our little, in our little world and keep it to ourselves, but it, it needs to happen. I did a, uh, and I tell this ties, I did a study uh, a few months ago. I was speaking um, to a group, a big corporation for the Women's Network Program, and during the conversation, a topic came up about companies not being able to keep and rank, retain women in senior level positions. So afterwards I thought, I said, well, this big company's having that problem, other companies are probably having it too. So I decided to undertake my own little study where I talked to uh, about 20 women and some men, so I get both perspectives, and mid and senior level management on 
what they what their experience was. And I remember one of the ladies told me that she felt, and that, that probably happened with us as a group, there was this generation gap where we had the 50 and above mm -hmm. women who had <coughs> faced many obstacles and dealt with them, overcome them. Mm -hmm. Then you have the 30 to 50 year old mm -hmm. women who taken advantage of those mm -hmm. women and their experiences. And then you have the 20 to 30s who don't seem to show the appreciation. Right. So she was saying we needed to have the older women mentoring some of the younger mm -hmm. women to give them the history and exposure that is lacking. Mm -hmm. So and I think they still need to do that. Let me take you a look out. Do you have any plans to or have ever thought of running for political office? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody asked that question too. Let me ask that. No, I mean, huh. So you talked about what are you doing in 2016? I said, I don't know, but I know what I'm not doing. <laughs> <laughs> you might not pay you enough money to be in politics. Yeah. No, yes. I couldn't deal with that. Um, you have, let me get somebody else. Hi. I'm Jane Snell Simpson of JS1 Construction. I'm a state licensed contractor here in Florida. Uh, I can relate to so many things that you're saying. Um, and a lot of those things are, that were happening back then, are uh, they are happening now. Mm -hmm. And there are new things that's even going on. Yeah. So I just wanted to say that. I'm not going to get on the top of that because I'll be there forever talking about those things. Mm -hmm. But um, you used to work for a company, a maintenance janitorial type service. And you went in and, and helped them get out of their financial issues. And I guess liked it so much that you decided to to be an entrepreneur yourself. Um, I want to know, did you wrestle with that decision? Because you actually worked for a company that did that type of service, and now you're competition. And then the second yes. part of my question is, were you confident, um, pretty confident when you did go out on your own, that you could do it yourself and, and succeed? The first question um, is, is an interesting story. <laughs> I did work for this company for three years and wasn't planning to go. And other people started talking to me about it. And I started thinking, you know, yeah, I could do this. Why not do it? And I, I incorporated and got my company started while I was still working there. But then I decided I was going to tell my boss that what I was doing because I didn't want him to hear it from someone else. Mm -hmm. So I went and talked to him and I told him, uh, interesting conversation. I told him I was going in business and he said, well, that's great. Oh, that's great. What kind of business are you going in? <laughs> told him the look on his face changed dramatically. But I made it clear to him, I said, you know, I'm I'm not I don't want I'm not gonna take your customer. I want to start my own business and I'll stay here until you find someone to replace me. I'll work with that person, train that person, etc. And so he agreed and I agreed that that's what would happen. About five days later he called me in one day and said <laughs> his board of directors, uh, I know who his board of directors was really his wife. <laughs> said that if I was going to leave, then I should probably leave at the end of the week. Well, this was like a way that I was planning to go to, well, I wanted to go away that weekend, so I left that day. Mm -hmm. So he messaged me, I got fired. Mm -hmm. uh, so then I had a choice of either starting getting the company going or going back to find a job. And I did not want to go back to find a job. But an interesting thing about this story is I did not take his customers. I, I just vowed that I would never do that. I would not take his customers. But he and I still maintain a good relationship. And I went into business in 1976. In 1981, I was, I was um, the recipient of the Small Business Person of the Year for the state of Maryland. And I got that award because my former boss recommended me. Oh, wow. 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 How up to you is don't burn your bridges. Right. You never know. Yeah, my mother tells you, you never know who you're going to need along the way and who can help you. Yes, over here. Hi, my name is Heather. I, I have a question. Based on your past education and professional experience, um, for aspiring business owners, um, what would be the best advice that you can give to them regarding getting contracts for their businesses? Getting contracts? Well, um, you know, that's a tough one because you got to you got to know your market very well and know what your customers want, and find ways to get to the decision makers. Uh, it means sometimes doing things that you're not comfortable doing. Um, 
Prepare yourself, know your market, be able to sell. How you sell yourself is so important. You're going to have the competition. Uh, instance, networking, you have to do some networking. I hate networking. I've done it because I have to do it. If I don't have to do it, I don't do it as much now. But when I was in business, no one would have ever known that I didn't like doing it. I was good at it, I just didn't like doing it. So you have to find ways to get to the decision maker, or maybe for creative ways to give them what they want. First of all, you gotta know exactly what their needs are. Uh, and when I, when I started in business, of course I knew the market very well. I knew a lot of things not to do and a lot of things to do, and I know what the, where the customers were, so it wasn't difficult. And the interesting thing about the business that I went into, when people going into business, I tell them go into a business that you either know very well that you've worked in or you've done some great research. And that's why I went into this business. I had experience in the business. People said, you had a Harvard MBA, why did you go to a janitorial firm? I said, well, it's better to own the mop than to push the mop. Right. Hey, you know. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I didn't clean buildings. I managed all those resources that cleaned the various buildings. And it was a very good business. And I was profitable my very first year. And I attribute that to the fact that I had the experience and I knew a lot of things to do, but I also knew a lot of things not to do. So uh, I, that's, that's one of the things that I would advise you here. And then I'll go over to you. Yeah, you. The last five years have been one of the most challenging times, whether you're in business or you're working corporately. How would you, have you found, and, and subsequently, uh, a lot of people have had to stay in the market or come back into the market. Mm -hmm. Have you found that to be a personal issue in today's world and in today's economy, especially with age discrimination? And so <coughs> well, my world's a little different now. I, I sold my business in 2001, so I'm not in the business now. I do speaking engagements, coaching, and that's a different world, and I'm, I guess semi-retired. I tried to retire full-time, but getting a breeze. <laughs> I can yeah, I like being out doing things. So I'm, I select the things that I want to do. It's more challenging to find the opportunities, it's true. So for people in the business world, you have to be much more creative now than you, you used to be, and you have to, you have to also be able to have people who are going to help pull you along the way. Mentors, you still need mentors. Anybody here in any, whether you're in corporate America, or student, whether you get mentors. These are people who can help guide you through. I define a mentor as uh, someone who's been in the minefields and they know where all the mines are and they can help identify them for you before you step on. So these are people who can navigate you through the waters, whether you're in corporate America or in business. If you're in business, you need to associate with other business owners, <coughs> associations. Get big people who are in your same business, maybe in another state, who can help mentor you or advise you. Because people in your own state may be a little reluctant if, you, if they're competing with you, and that will tell you so much. But there are people all over willing to do it. But you just have to find ways to do it and find creative ways that they are doing it. Don't be afraid to tell people you don't know something or you need help. To me, help is a sign of strength, not weakness. Asking for help is a sign of strength, not weakness. So if you don't have, say, for instance, a board of advisors or people you can just call up and ask questions or run things by, you need to do that. Because it's, it's tough out there. And I promise to go over here. I think I've been neglecting all the people over this side. <coughs> yes? Um, there's a lot of empty people here. OK. There's why I need to pay some attention. It's so good to see them in the room. Um, but what would you say, you talked about mentors, what would you say is probably a key point for them to be able to work with their instructors, their professors at this point in their lives in order to get to their stage? Well, one of the things I tell students, whether it's undergraduate, whatever level of school you are in college, you're, going, you're, you're in school, you're there to learn as much as you can, or whomever you can. <coughs> you have your professor, first of all, you find out what your professors want. Give them what they need for you to succeed. If they're more, a lot of students go, particularly in college, they go and fight the professor. A professor know what you're talking about. I'm not gonna do that. Hey, he's a professor. You, know, right? <laughs> you gotta give them what they need, what they want. So, and then you can find other ways to supplement it. But ask questions. Don't be afraid to approach your professors. Many of them will ask a question. They, some of them are wondering why you don't come talk to them. I'll give you a good example. When I was an undergraduate at Howard, I had this course, physical science. 
I hate it, son. <laughs> <laughs> and we have a, at Howard, they have this place uh, they're called Death Valley, where all the science courses are. And really, it was a Death Valley for me. <laughs> and this professor, Professor Page, brilliant man, we, we, had a, we had a lecture, lecture hall. We went in, 100 people in the class. So he's writing up all these formula things on the board, and I, it was like Greek to me. I had no idea what he was talking about. And I said, I know I'm going to fail this class. I just can't fail it. So one day, and I thought he was unapproachable. One day I said, well, I'm just going to talk to him. I went into his office, and he was so friendly and helpful. Wanted to know what he could do to help me. And I told him how much problem I was having, and I didn't understand what he was doing. He said, OK, I'll tell you what I'll do. You, I'll give you a project. If you do this project, it'll help you. He gave me a project. I had designed this radio system or something. Well, I lived with our cousin mm -hmm. and her son. He loved doing that stuff. He went out and bought this little tool kit, and he helped me work on this radio thing. We put it together, got all these wires running. I took it to school the next day and hooked it up, and I said, oh my god, please let it work. <laughs> <laughs> he turned the button, and music started playing. And he smiled, and he said, that's a great job. He said, well, I got to be out of there, <laughs> To go talk to them. They don't know you're even having problems or difficulty if you don't let them know it. If they're not receptive, then hey, you, at least you know that. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Good uh, afternoon. I'm sorry to survive, but um, I'm really, really uh, excited to be here. I own a spa cleaning service called Legally Clean. And what would you suggest for someone who, uh, in terms of approaching um, owners of our property management company? I mean, would you, would you have any? I mean, there's no, I mean, there's no one way to do it. You know, first of all, I don't know anything about your property management company. Okay. You know, first of all, I'd say go to the point of least resistance. The one that you either know or someone know can get you in there. Definitely. That's how I got into my first property management company. I had a friend who was a friend of a property management company, and he introduced me. Okay. So try to find somebody who knows someone and get you in there. I don't know how, how easy it is now to walk in. Did you do residential or commercial? Or commercial, 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 just oh, commercial. commercial. Did you have government contracts as well? I had government contracts to start. Oh. And I stayed on the program for about nine years on the AA program. I didn't, I, most of my contracts were government initiative, uh -huh. but then they, I flipped and most of them were commercial when I, well. I started. So it's, that's a difficult question for me to specifically give you an answer without knowing more information about your market, but I would say in general, Go to the point of least resistance. Try to get in through someone who knows someone. And if you have some uh, good uh, references you can give them, okay. that's fine. Very good. Thank you. Okay, this will get so interesting. I never thought about these questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's why I need some guidance. I have to get carried away. Okay, I already told you about my education experience, I guess, and why I took the route I did. I think I have to. Okay, I think I've danced with that one pretty much. What about my education experience, which I told you pretty much, and why I took the route I took uh, for different reasons. Why did I write my book, The Road to Someplace Better? Um, that uh, was published a couple, a couple of years ago, and I had no, I wasn't going to write a book either. <laughs> But people kept talking to me about putting my experience on paper, and I kept trying to not do it. Um, it goes back as far as in the 90s, I think, when someone first asked me about doing it. It was a young lady who was a student who had also graduated from Harvard. She wrote a book about the lessons my mother, something about things my mother taught. And she asked me to give her a quote from my mother in that book, and I gave her a quote about uh, education, I think. And then she said to me, well, you should write a book. And I said, I don't want to write a book. And I don't have time to write a book. I'm busy running my company, and I, don't, I can't do that. So she said, well, I'll give you my agent's name and at least talk to her. I did talk to her and sent her a, a, a manuscript which she liked, a brief manuscript, and thought she could get it published. But then she sent it back and said she couldn't uh, really publish it at that time. So I just put it on the shelf. And in 2003, I, was, I received the Alumni Achievement Award from Harvard Business School, which is the highest award they give alumni. <laughs> And they sent a young lady down to do the write-up for the book that they were publishing. And after the interview, interview, she said, you should write a book. I said, I heard that before, been there, done that. I don't want to write a book. 
And she asked me to give her the manuscript so she could take a look at it. Maybe she could help work with it. And she took it and kept it for a while and gave it back. And said she was going to send it back because she didn't have time to do it. She kept it for a while. And then one day she called me and she said, I have great news. I met this lady and I told her about you and the, uh, you know, this manuscript. And she read it. And she wants to work with you on writing this book. So I met this lady. And we had got together. And we agreed that I wouldn't take time to write the book. Because so many people had told me that they thought my experience should be written. And you know, there are a lot of people who have experiences like mine or very similar differences in mine in their own paper. And people can read about it. So that's why I ended up writing the book. It was an interesting experience, but it, it, writing a book is not an easy job, believe me. Getting it published and all of those things. But things fell into place because my, it, and it's interesting how things happen. I think it was probably the time because the way things develop and things that happen in place that this lady came into my life at that particular time to write the book. And then it was a question, how do we get it published, finding an agent? And one of the professors at, at Harvard, Professor David Thomas, they, one of the ladies knew him and said, we'll go talk to him and see if he can give us some insight on what we need to do. They went in and talked to him, and they didn't know what to ask him because they didn't know anything about writing this book either. So he finally said to them, what can I do to help you? And they sort of looked at each other, and he said, would you like to meet my agent? Exactly what they needed. So he introduced me. That's what I mean. You get people who know something. He introduced me to his agent because I may have been still looking for an agent had I not had that contact. And she took the uh, manuscript and shopped it for a publisher. So that's how I ended up actually publishing the book, because a number of people kept talking to me about it and the value that it would have for others. And as a result of that, I have had a number of people who read the book, and I think there's some books around here. You got one, OK. <laughs> yeah. All right, that, uh, uh, and people have told me that they, they, they've been inspired by my story, and it's encouraged them to do things they thought they couldn't do, and other people can relate to the story and share many of the things that I experienced. So, I promise this man. Yeah. Uh, there are lots of young people here, and I'm sure they are thinking about going to Harvard. <laughs> and, and the question is, what other than a GP or a really good score do they need to, to get into that school? Well, I, I don't know now. You know, you have to really check that out. But the things have changed. But when I went, the uh, uh, GPA wasn't quite as important as uh, the, um, um, the application. The application was critical. It was about an eight-page application with, mm -hmm. write, I think I had to write four <laughs> essays on the questions that he said. And they read those essays very carefully. And I had my professors put you another guy to read my essay before I sent them in. But that may have changed. And also, well, some schools put a different amount of weight on the graduate management admission test at Harvard. Mm -hmm. Undergraduate. And if there are people who are interested in undergraduate, I would strongly recommend you do look into it. They have some special scholarships at Harvard now for, for uh, young people who can't afford to go there. And lots of times, they don't get enough applications. Okay. So that's money that's wasted. Uh, they should uh, look into it. Do the research. Start getting them young people to do some of their own research. It's a good experience for them to learn how to go through the, there's a lot of money out there for scholarships. A lot of it goes wasted. Mm -hmm. I didn't go to Harvard on a scholarship. I wish I could have. And I did, some people asked me, did I go there under their affirmative action program? I said, what? At Harvard? <laughs> affirmative action program? Are you kidding me? <laughs> 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 Let me get somebody else. They, uh, I mean, the young people a little bit. Let me get some young people a little bit. They can, I think I can tell them. Oh, yes. My sister, she loves writing books. And she wanted to open the book if you had any advice for her. Where's your sister? She's out there. She's out She doesn't go to the same school as me. Oh, okay, she's not here, right? Yeah. I'm gonna say, if she wants to know that, yeah, I got you answering her question. <laughs> 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 yeah, I was gonna say, she's not here, right? Well, actually, actually, if she loves writing, start writing your now, publishing is much easier. If I, had, if I wrote a book now, I would not go, I don't think I'd go to an established publishing house. I would do so many more self-publishing, e-books, all kinds of less expensive ways. The advantage publish, publishing houses of course, uh, you know, they do the old fancy covering and all of those kinds of things. You have to pay extra. But they control things, too. If you, you know, if you print your own, do your own publishing, you can print as many as you want, buy as many as you want. And there are some established good self-publishing resources now. There weren't a lot in place when I did it, but there are lots of. Tell her to do some research on if she wants to get books published. But I know a lot of young people who've written things, and they've uh, 
gotten them done, they self-published it, but she needs to do some research on what's involved in publishing. How old is she? She's 15. 15? Oh, yeah, she's old enough to start looking at something. <laughs> Were there ever moments where you wanted to quit? How many moments? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, 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 that's another story. I did try to quit once, really tried. I was, uh, I, I, my father passed away while I was at Harvard. I went in 67, and he passed in February of 68. And I went home to Virginia to my uh, father's funeral, came back, and a real bad snowstorm, and the actual plane almost ran off the runway into the river when I landed, so I had all kinds of little experience with that. But I was really kind of down then after that, and things were tough, and I said, oh, why am I here? I really don't want to be here. And there was one professor that I felt very comfortable talking to, Professor Atlas was his name. So I said, I'm going to tell Professor Athos that you know, I, I've got to quit. So I went and made a point, went in and talked to him, and I told him that my father had passed. He said, well, I knew that. And then I gave this long story about how hard it was for me there. My mother was at home in the country and living on this farm by herself, and she couldn't drive, and she really needed me to be at home and then by a whole longer, and I've got to quit. So he looked at me and said, okay, go ahead and quit. Yeah. <laughs> I know your mother doesn't need you at home, and you were doing okay here. But if you want to quit, then just go ahead and quit. And I said, I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to let him make me quit. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't quit. <laughs> yeah, I went in looking for sympathy, and he gave me none. <laughs> so I guess he could have done that. But so yes, I've had a number of times when I wanted to quit, but you know, something either in my mind or that was a unique kind of experience that I, I'm not sure. Yeah, you know, I'm not sure what would happen if he had been very sympathetic. I I, I don't know if I'd have quit or not. I never know. Let you go to here, and then I'll switch over. Yes. Do you still own your business today? No, I sold it in 2001, and I'm not sure. I'm. I have second thoughts about what I should have, but hey, I don't spend a lot of time dealing with what's happened in the past. I can't do anything about that. But I can influence the future. I know you're going to go over there, but what about with your business? That have, when you were in business, were there a lot of times you wanted to quit? Because I do. <laughs> like every other day. <laughs> you know, I'm not sure I ever really wanted to quit. I like being an, an owner. Entrepreneur. I make a lousy employee now. <laughs> <laughs> I've been at times when things were tough, but I don't know that I really wanted to quit. But there's, you know, there's a time to, I wrote an article on knowing when it's time to leave. When you get to the point where you've lost the passion, you really don't want to go to work anymore, and it's not exciting to you, then maybe you'll think about leaving. I, and I, I reached that point, I think, I probably should have gotten out of college or done something different maybe a, year, a couple of years before I did. Mm -hmm. Later, back there. Um, I'm taking notes while you get on. Wait a minute. I got, oh, I need to look at some of these questions again. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm going to deal with this next one. After your question, I'm going to deal with this. Okay. I keep forgetting they, they're here. I noticed during the lecture you spoke a lot about um, things were unplanned during your career endeavor. So I wanted to know what kind of advice can you give someone as they venture onto their career path and these unplanned things come their way? How should they look at it? Well, you know, you, it's good to have a plan, but you've got to remain flexible enough to make adjustments and changes when things are not working the way you are. You may have a plan, but it doesn't mean it's not made in concrete. You've got to be flexible and be able to make adjustments. If things, opportunities come along that you interest you, you should you should maybe explore it. I, I, there's one that came my way that I didn't explore, which I had when I was in business. Uh, I had a contract with a company that uh, was called a company called Multivision. They were like laying cable, and they told me you should get into the cable business, and I didn't even look into it. Can you imagine what would happen? I got into the cable business. But maybe I wouldn't be standing here today. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to deal with one of those questions of here. What are some things you feel you were able to build a business during a time when women business owners were so few? Okay. As I mentioned, there were few women business owners, but you, being, having the feeling that just because nobody else has done it doesn't mean that you can't do it. I was very confident that I could do this business. I had the first, I was well trained in it. And the fact that there were no women in it was a deterrent for me. But I recognized that I would probably run into situations where men may not feel that I would be as good as I am. But then there were also others who welcomed me into the industry. So I was able to, to do that then. And as far as 
as, and the issue that women are still dealing with surprise me. I've dealt with them the work life balance situation kind of thing. That was also an issue I had to work with. I had two small kids during that time. But uh, I was very fortunate because when I had my first child, my mother had reached the point where she decided she didn't want to stay on the farm anymore by herself. I guess she was excited about having the grandchildren. She came to live with me. And she took care of my um, firstborn. And when I had my second, uh, so a couple of years later, a year and a half later, she was able to take care of both of them. So my husband and I basically um, discussed it and decided that we would make the sacrifice necessary to bring someone into the house to look after the kids under my mother's supervision so that we would have to take them out. And that gave me the flexibility of spending the time with the kids uh, that when I came home I didn't have to do the normal things like cook and clean and all those things. I could t spend time doing things with the kids. When I started my business, I started a business in my garage working from home because I didn't need to go to see my, my customers didn't come to my office. I went to them so I could operate out of my home without a problem. You know, everybody's doing it now. It was, it was not something most people did during that time. And then I worked a lot at night, so I was able to spend time during the day going to, to, to the kids' school, participating in school activities. You just have to find a way to make that work for you. And I tell people, everybody's situation is different. You have to make the decision that works for you and those affected by the decision. And if it works for you, that's fine. And once you make your decision, don't let other people make you feel guilty about what you decided to do. It works for you. So those are things that I dealt with as a, a female owner. And uh, gradually that began to be <coughs> groups set up for support of women business owners like the National Association of Women Business Owners, those are, they didn't exist when I started my business. There are lots of them around now. I mean, no, let me let this young lady over here. Wait a minute. Okay. Let me hear you. When you were writing your book, what was like the hardest thing to overcome? What was the hardest thing to overcome? Well, actually, for me, since it was my story, I had to tell it. Nobody can tell your story but you. So I had to actually do the writing. And then the, the lady who worked with me, uh, co uh, Rosemary Brubaker, she framed it in a way that she was a writer. So she framed it in a way that it would be interesting to read it. But I remember. The uh, publisher my, uh, at, at Wally saying to me, you've got to write, you know, you've got to describe and not tell. And I had the hardest time putting my arm around, what is she talking about? I finally learned it. I, you had to, I had to write it so that the reader could basically feel that they were there in that situation as opposed to me just telling what happened. Well, the day I went to the store. Uh, the day I roamed around, I got to describe, describe the building, describe the situation. That was the most difficult thing for me to learn how to do that. And working with the the uh, publisher to meet their whatever demands they had, meeting their deadlines, all those things. They have deadlines set up for you. Let me see. Do we have any more questions? Let me check one here. They're going to remind me. I got to ask these questions too. Well, I guess I answered that one. The balance between family and career. I explained how I did that. I think I covered that question. Yeah, I mean, let me, you, let me get back to you. you just, a, just a quick question. Um, what, what would you say the main qualities were for you to get to the success? Persistence, one of them. Resilience, uh, another one. Courage, I would guess persistent. Persistent, see, I, I keep going and stuff till it. I make it happen. I'm kind of, uh, some people say I'm determined to the point of being stubborn, and sometimes they're right. I'm, I'm a Taurus, so, you know, they say we're stubborn. <laughs> but I, 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 I'm, I'm very persistent. I'll keep pushing. And I, I can bounce back from bad situations. Uh, I don't dwell on negative things that happen to me. You know, I just go, well, okay, that happens, so I gotta move on. I try to do things not to make that happen again or similar things. And learn from those experiences. That's what I try to do. That's a learning experience. And same thing about people who feel they failed at something. It's not just a failure. If you learn something from that experience, you take those that positive and go on to do other things. Yeah. You mentioned the uh, three C's of success and the one of the C's is confidence. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the most important C. And um, I'm just wondering, 
How did you develop that confidence? Was you a confident person to begin with? Did your parents instill it to you? I mean, how did you become supremely confident in yourself and your abilities to make well, it in business? I would think uh, my mother was probably the biggest factor, man. My mom told me I could do anything I wanted to do, and I started believing it. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So I think she always was very supportive, and she never criticized anything that I did. She might ways questions at all, make sure. But she was always supportive. And you know, I, as a, when I moved around a lot when I was in college and trying different things. I'm very adventurous. I'd go to places I'd never been and live on body. My mom finally told me she was going to stop writing my address in ink because I moved to all. <laughs> <laughs> but in pencil. But she never, she was always supportive of things I wanted to do. So I, I had a lot of confidence in myself. You, you. I won't let you be. <laughs> I just have a quick question about your mother. You just uh, spoke about her briefly. You mentioned that she graduated from college in the 20s. Were there any opportunities for her? Was she able to do anything with her college degree? or? She taught, she taught for a year, a um, couple of years, when she first got graduated from college. And, and I think she would have continued to teach. I think she liked it, would probably make a great teacher. But when she married um, my father, she, and she thought I had kids, she could. Matter of fact, speaking of teaching, when I wrote my book, I went back to Ballsville to interview this 90-year-old guy who mm -hmm. knew everything about what went on. And I, 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 and I did, I've asked my parents, I asked him, I asked him did he know how my parents met? And he did, he told me how they met. And uh, he said that my mother taught him, and then she said, she was the meanest teacher I had. Leave me alone with me, because she flunked him once. <laughs> That's what that means. She's mean. <laughs> of course, he thought she was mean because he flunked. But he, he knew all of the history of, of my of my parents and how they met. But she did work for a while. I think she would have uh, continued if she had decided to. I guess, I guess that's an example of where <coughs> you make a decision that works for you and your family, mm -hmm. and don't let other people make you feel guilty. I'm sure right. people said to my mom, you know, you got this education. Why don't you teach? Why don't you work? Well, she thought being home to take care of kids was more important. And then she, when as we got older. She went back to work, but at that time she couldn't teach. She ended up working as a, a domestic, working for families. You know, there weren't a lot of opportunities for them. But you, and then I'm gonna let you. you but you got to, you got to think about your question. Oh, no, I have it. Don't give me a like. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No. Uh, we had in, we had single rooms in the dorm, and I said my second year that we did have a, we had a suite, and I had a roommate, but it was like I didn't have one. She was she was an older student too, and they quite put it. She was from North Carolina, but we had nothing in common. We were all able to talk to each other. I had uh, we had single rooms, and we just had an individual room with a closet, and we had a we had a communal bathroom. We had to go to home to the bathroom, shower, and all that stuff. We had a dining hall. Um, so it wasn't great, it wasn't great, not like these dorms now. I, I'm on the board of visitors at Virginia Commonwealth University. They, they had us to tour a, what they call it, a living, this new dorm they built. This is, I mean, this dorm is fabulous. It's like, I could live there year round. <laughs> They're not the dorms like you have now. They were really bare minimum. No, I guess because of the graduate level, I was just thinking of the Michelle Obama experience, and I ended up being roommate. <coughs> Oh no, no, I didn't have a roommate. Yeah, single room, yeah. Single room. And most of the women, we, you know, the women in my class, we pretty much got along fine. There wasn't uh, much conflict. There were some a little closer than others. But I had, I had a couple good, decent friends in the dorm. There were no, I mean, you think of the dorm, there were no, there were no black women in the dorm. One, <coughs> two of us lived in the dorm, the graduate dorm. So we were pretty isolated. Okay. You got all right. Well, first of all, I would like to apologize for any confusion that I caused. But I would like to introduce myself. My name is Sophie Andrew, and I'm a freshman here, an international studies major. Um, I am also a contributing writer for the newspaper, so that's why I want to do you justice. And <laughs> so I don't want to leave out anything. So to sum it up, I want to know. I try to find common ground. When I look at politics, I remove the Republican, I remove the Democrat, and I see, and I talk to different people. And I see that the main problem that I've noticed this pattern is 
sometimes people have trouble leaving their moral values outside of economic um, situations. But you, you're such an expert. I want to know how you do it because when you come saying that you left your boss, telling him, I will not take any of your employees. I'm going to start my own business from the bottom. Mm -hmm. That takes a strong character to do something like that. Mm -hmm. What drive did okay. you have to? One of my, um, over, the, over the years, I've developed what I call my guiding principles. And one of my, one of my guiding principles is mm -hmm. a moral compass is essential. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very important okay. as you go into business. Because okay. particularly in today's society, a moral compass mm -hmm. is essential. You've got to have good morals. Morality has to play a part in the success. Particularly in today's environment where there's so much corruption and things going on, you have to know who you are, establish your values, and be willing to live by them. Now, I would attribute this to the fact that my values were established growing up on that farm. You know, my mother and parents instilled in me values that I didn't know about. You know, we, they made us go to church. You know, I didn't want to go. I, a lot of you don't want to go. And my reasons were going to be different than their reasons for sending me. I wouldn't socialize with my friends. But as you go through that process and just learn the values, you'll be surprised that later in life, how much of that stuff really sticks with you, if you remember. So you have to decide. If you can decide uh, your own values, not let society or someone else dictate them to you, you'd be much better off. You can be influenced by what other people say and write, but deep down within, you know what's right. Even when I went into business, I had another opportunity to wear my, you know, you'd be tested, particularly in business. I was offered a contract. This guy owned a, he worked for the city government, and he was in charge of contract. He told me that he could get this contract for me. It was a nice contract. I really wanted a couple hundred thousand dollars. But in order for me to get it, I had to give him a kickback. I turned it down and told him no. I wouldn't gonna play that game. At some point later on, he ended up in jail. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you have to know where the line is and not be willing to cross it. Yes. I, I, may I just comment on that? Um, I've, I've practiced law, I've been practicing law 31 years and I'm with an international known law firm partner. And I remember once, as I was growing up, and I also r raised as a Christian and I, and I served the Lord. I remember somebody s said, well, Don, you're gonna be, and you wanna be an ethical lawyer? You never make any money. Mm. Well, I'm making money now, and that's where the person, unfortunately, happens permanently at this bar. Wow. The bottom line is this: if you can make all the money in the world, you can do a, do a, you know you can do a whole lot of things, but you still got to live with yourself. Yeah, live you with yourself. Mirror, and you got to be able to say, "This is this is who I am, and I know who I am, and I, I know I haven't done perfectly, but I know I've been true to myself." Yes, mm -hmm. that's very important. How much time do we have? Okay. Okay. Two more questions. Okay, let me ask a question. Got the characteristics up here for us. Okay, young lady right here. Um, was there ever any major distractions that will stop you? Um, I mean, there are always distractions. I mean, what, what are you talking about, life? Like, Catastrophes happening, or something that maybe you want to quit, or like a personal experience. No, nothing, nothing like that. That uh, I mean, there are things that happen that you want to quit, but nothing to the point that it would have an impact on what uh, I choose between doing the business or doing taking care of something else. I haven't had that kind of situation, and if that you know, when that come, that happens sometimes, and then you have to decide what's really important. Or is it something that affects somebody else in your life that you have to do, do take care of them? For instance, if you have to make a choice between taking care of your parent and running my business, then I would probably have chosen to quit and take care of my, my parents. If that was, was not was the only option. So you have to deal with those on a case by case situation. I got one more question over here. I got three people. Are they quick? <laughs> <laughs> now let me ask you. You had a question. Let me go to somebody who hasn't had a question. This young man here. Um, what are some singular traits that you believe someone from an issue of class or seeking guidance might share with the class of 2015? And how do you think the school finds those people? How? What are some of the some of the traits? 
that they're looking for for students coming in. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, that's hard to say because I know it's changed over the years, but let me give you an example. When I went there, they wanted uh, students who had some work experience and the way they, someone asked the question of what they look at and evaluating, et cetera, and certain great fun habits. But I know for a lot of time for women, they've done a flip on that. They now want more women who are coming out of undergraduate, directly into the graduate program. What they found is that it was conflict for women. If you go to undergraduate, you work for three or four years, and then you go to business school, by that time, you're almost 30. If you want to raise a family, it con they can't have time to work. So they found it better for accepting more women coming in uh, directly from undergraduate and getting their MBA working and somehow working on how they incorporate family into that. So it's difficult for me to ask that question now as far as, so that, I guess the best thing is for you to find out directly from them what they're looking for them. Because it's a lot different than when I was there. You know, back when I was school, about 40 years. So, you know. so you're saying that you're not sure if there are any traits that the community shares going back to perhaps the founding in the present time? I'm sure there are some. I'm just not sure what they are from the school's perspective. I know that they still value developing people who have general, a lot of variety of skills in general management, but they've also found the need to concentrate in certain areas like being an entrepreneur or being, um, you know, finance was a strong finance and consultant with a field that most people went into when I graduated from school. But I don't think that's the case now. There are many more, they're training many more people for entrepreneurship and different positions and corporations specifying certain areas as opposed to just being a general manager. So I, I don't know how much of that has changed as far as what the founders say, but that's a good research project for you. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe you can let me know. <laughs> so next time somebody asks that question, I say, yes, this young man that, uh, you go to school here? Um, actually, no, I'm <laughs> Okay, and maybe you can share that with me when you find that. <laughs> okay, I guess we're I think we're done. <laughs>